past year has been hard on Hoosiers and Americans across the country. When the economy was shut down, Congress got to work. Given my background as a business owner, I was involved in negotiating the Paycheck Protection Program, known as PPP. As part of the CARES Act, one of five bills that passed in 2020 with overwhelming support, uh, I think 90 votes plus, we worked it out, Democrats and Republicans together. Those COVID-related packages totaled $4 trillion, and we didn't have a penny saved up ahead of time to prepare for it. And that's part of a deeper problem with this institution, is that we borrow anything that we spend money on, even 23 percent of our annual operating budget. To put that in perspective, imagine if you had a business doing uh, $100,000 in revenues and you're losing $23, $23,000, and then you'd go to your banker and expect them to bail you out. Wouldn't make sense. We came into 2021 with over a trillion dollars from those packages, unspent, unobligated. Instead of working with us like before, Democrats did shut us out of the process. In fact, the Senate as a whole did not work the bill through committees. It was laid to us on the Senate by the House, all $1.9 trillion of it. Before this, some Republicans went to the White House to talk with the President about a bipartisan plan, knowing all of the money would be borrowed again, but nothing came to fruition. Instead, we stayed up all night, finished the bill at noon the next day, Saturday, spent 29 hours on the floor, and not a single Republican amendment was adopted in this massive spending bill. Instead of focusing on the virus and getting our economy back on track, this became an exercise in ramming something through that was a liberal wish list. Only 1% of the bill, 1% of the bill, went toward the vaccine. Less than 9% goes toward COVID-19 public health issues generally. While the Congressional Budget Office projects the economy to return to pre-pandemic levels by mid-year, only 5% of the $130 billion for K-12 schools gets spent this year. And none of it is tied to reopening our schools, which many states had shut down early and opened up late. Included in this package is a whopping $350 billion for state and local governments. Had a conversation with our own governor two, three weeks ago. A place like Indiana, and I believe West Virginia as well, probably runs balanced budgets. We do it with the guardrail of a constitutional amendment. Many other states, if they don't have a constitutional amendment, they have a statute. In other words, you do what households do, you do what all businesses do, you live within your means. And here, when you run your state governments in a way that in good times you can't make ends meet, and you look to the federal government to bail out your bad governance, it's a whole other issue. Even left-leaning economists and think tanks are worried about what this is going to do down the road, because most of the time you don't feel the repercussions until later. And of course, that could show up in inflation. It could show up in a way similar to what we dealt with in the late 70s and the early 80s. 44 states had surpluses last year when you look at COVID funding. So many places like California had surpluses. And then they reconfigured how this was done, not based on pro rata population, but rewarded the states with the highest unemployment levels. Sounds bizarre to me. Governor Holcomb in Indiana has done a great job balancing the economy with public safety. And that's why our unemployment rate is now 
close to a full employment rate. It was the lowest in the Midwest going into it because we got a good business climate, we got a low cost of living, things work there. Sadly, the Democrats' bill punishes states like Indiana for safely reopening. The higher a state's unemployment rate, again, the more bailout money you get proportionately. But it goes one step further, and this is the part that caught my attention, and I'm interested to hearing the explanation for it. I think it was a sneaky maneuver when you put it in such a large bill that had other doozies like uh, stimulus checks for undocumented immigrants, for felons, uh, all kinds of stuff that I think, when you look at it, shouldn't have been in there, but when it's that massive, it takes 10, 11 hours to read out loud, you're going to get some of that. What this does is that if a state takes federal money, they cannot lower their state taxes in any way through 2024. First of all, I believe this is unconstitutional and coercive. Second, we should never punish states for putting taxpayers first. We serve the public and should be good stewards of their money, and especially a place like this that runs the way it does day in and day out should not be telling states that run their operations responsibly that they cannot do what they want with spending or taxation. My bill strikes a provision that prohibits states' ability to change revenues as they see fit for their state's unique needs. Second, my bill strips out the reporting requirement where states have to tell the federal government about every revenue source and amount of money they take in. This place ought to be doing that routinely to all the people that send it revenue. This bill has the support of over 25 groups, including the American Legislative Exchange Council, Americans for Prosperity, Americans for Tax Reform, Citizens Against Government Waste, Club for Growth, Freedom Works, Heritage Action for America, Independent Women's Forum, and the National Taxpayer Union among others. We expect many more to join in coming days. And I'm sure many stakeholders in Indiana and West Virginia, not mentioned, will throw in support as well. Lastly, I'd like to thank the Finance Committee Ranking Member Senator Crapo for co-sponsoring this legislation along with other colleagues, including Senator Blackburn, Capito, Enhoff, Marshall, Rubio, Rick Scott, Tillis, and Senator Young from my home state. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the Committee on Finance be discharged from further consideration of S-730 and Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. I further ask that the bill be considered read a third time and passed and that the motion to reconsider be considered, made, and laid upon the table.